Welcome to the Antioch Podcast, designed to nurture knowledge, cultivate creativity, heal the heart, and strengthen for service. Thanks for listening, and welcome home. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. We find ourselves in the midst of the Christmas season, and um, I remember growing up, which is interesting because I grew up Jewish, but everyone always said Merry Christmas as soon as December hit. You heard it all the time. I feel like I don't hear it much anymore. Um, so let's, let's, uh, let's say Merry Christmas to one another. Let's, uh, let's be willing to, to share that blessing with others as we see them in the world. Um, gosh. So, um, I don't know where I'm going really quick. Let me just say this because I just feel like I need to. I woke up, um, gosh, what was it, last Monday or this, this past Monday, and like it threw up my back. It hurt really bad. Um, and the last time this happened, it hurt for like a month. It was really intense. And uh, so I took a day off and I just took some time to rest. And then um, it started hurting again on Friday. Uh, so it hurts pretty bad right now. So, um, yeah, I just want you to know that. Please be praying for me because that's, uh, that's kind of driving me crazy. Um, but here's the thing. Yesterday, yesterday I rested, and it's Shabbat, and it's good to rest on Shabbat, and we should rest on Shabbat. Um, but here's the thing. Um, I noticed I slept a lot yesterday. And um, but here's the thing. I distracted myself a lot yesterday. And I feel like I neither worked nor truly rested. And my soul was so tired by the time we got to the evening. Because I, I always, on, um, on Saturday night after Shabbat ends, after Sabbath ends, I always take some time to work on the message and to read through it again and process the stuff. And I just felt completely empty when I went to do it. And now the reason I share this with you is because I want to make sure we always remember there's a difference between resting and um, distracting ourselves. Resting isn't wasting time. It's using it really, really well. You're using it for the restoration of your soul, to connect with God, to, to get to a place of peace and remind yourselves of, of, of God is with me and, and, and I will have the strength through this rest, through this time with him to last me throughout the week. Um, versus just distracting yourselves. And, and, and here's the weird thing about it. So I'm just confessing a little bit to you guys. I mean, we're in James 5 today, so it's, it's reasonable for me to talk about it. I've actually been thinking a lot about confession. Um, I'll probably talk about it next week with you guys. Um, I want to make sure that we use the time God gives us well. And I don't know why this feels so important today. Work is a good thing. Work isn't a bad thing. Work is an incredible gift. In paradise, in heaven, we will work. When God created and before the fall, there was work to be done. Work is an incredible blessing from God. And, and it strengthens us and it builds us. And it's, it's, it's an incredible gift. Rest is also an incredible gift. It's wonderful. It's not just the absence of work. Rest is something where you, um, you lean into God and you, you receive from him all that you need, your sustenance. But sometimes we distract ourselves. And I'm, I'm in this too, okay? This is me too. Sometimes we distract ourselves. 
and nothing good, nothing beautiful is developed in the process of doing that. You're literally wasting time. Um, I don't know about you, but there's times where um, Corey will notice it usually before I do. She's like, what are you doing? I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, you're just wandering around the house. I'm like, I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing. I am. I'm literally just walking around the house. So there's, there's my confession. Lord, help us to use our time well. These are precious days. Incredibly precious days that you've given us. Lord, teach me to count my days. To remember that in every single one of them, I have an opportunity to be a blessing to you, either through my work or through my rest and time with you. In both work and rest, Lord, you meet me and you give me fullness of joy. Help me to use my time well. Amen. Okay, sorry. I just, maybe I just needed that. So thank you. Please pray for me. I need your prayers. Um, Preacher flesh is no different than... uh, congregant flesh we all struggle we all have hard times and um, I mean it's not like I was anyway let's just leave it at that Um, we're in the book of James so if you have your Bibles open up to James 5 and let's take a look and see what the Lord has for us today Uh, James 5 is kind of a hard uh, start for today. Um, He begins this final chapter of the book of James with an Old Testament-like proclamation of judgment. So welcome to church. Um, It's a proclamation of judgment upon the wealthy who've been persecuting the church, taking the members of the church to court, giving them a hard time. And these are the people who are fighting against God, who are opposed to God and what God is doing in the world. So that's where we pick up. Are you guys there? James 5? Cool. Let's take a look. Now listen, you rich people. Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who is not opposing you. Okay, rough start. Um, but you know, you guys listen, at, at, at least here where, where God has called me to be and called me to lead, we're not going to skip verses of scripture just because they're hard. And just because they're uncomfortable, we want to look at the whole counsel of Scripture. And I think James is trying to lay something out here. It's something that's incredibly important. The first thing that you should notice in this is in the rest of the letter, when he's bringing a hard word, he's always starting it by saying brothers and sisters and clearly speaking to his spiritual children. And it's always followed up with like repent Make it right. Fix this thing. We can't keep going in this direction. This is different. This is a very different portion that he's writing here. He's laying out an Old Testament-like prophetic condemnation against the world and against those who are opposed to to God and and his Christ. Um, 
it's clearly a message to those outside of the church. So why is he putting this in his letter to the believers? It's an interesting thought. Let's just take a moment and process that a little bit. If this is a message for the world, why is he writing it to the church? What's the purpose of him putting this in this letter? I think he has two reasons in mind, and, and, and that's kind of what follows. But the first, there is always a temptation to fall into the ways of the world. He knows his history. He knows the history of the church. He knows the history of the Jewish people and how this happens over and over and over again. And so I think he's proclaiming this this judgment and, and making sure, hey, don't forget, this is what awaits those who oppose God, who oppose God and, and the wealthy who are taking advantage of others and just hoarding and, and keeping things for themselves. This is what awaits them. And, and you as the church need to hear this, not because you're them, but you could very easily become them again. And in case you want me to justify that a bit more, let's take a look at Revelation 3, verse 14 through 19. These are the letters to the churches. This is the letter to the church in Laodicea. Now, there's a lot of theologians who believe that um, the letters to the churches, they were letters to actual churches at the time, no question about that, but there's also some suggestion that maybe the order of the letters to the church represent the ages of the churches in the history of, of, um, of this age. And if we are living in the last times, in the end times, in the last days, this would correspond to the church today. And here's what he says. I'm going to pick up in verse 14. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, these are the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. And I'm I'm going to skip ahead to verse 17. You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent." Okay, let's be real. It is easy for us to slip into this mindset. The church in the world today, especially the church in in the U.S., we have a lot. The amount of property that the church owns, not us. I mean, we have very little, but... uh, (laughs) But overall, the amount of property, the amount of wealth, the amount of resources, it becomes very easy to begin to hoard that stuff, to hold on to that stuff and hold it close instead of using it for what God calls us to use it for. Um, I I think it was Rick Warren um, they asked him, is it, is it a sin to be a millionaire? And I thought his answer was very good. He said, it's not a sin to be a millionaire. It's a sin to die one. How many times did this happen to the Jewish people throughout the Old Testament that all of a sudden, you know, they, they would be rescued, they would re- be redeemed, they would be saved Let's use our terminology. They would be saved and be celebrating their salvation and God is our salvation and everything's wonderful. And then all of a sudden, blessings start coming. They, they get the milk and the honey. They get the vine from the, the, the vineyard that they didn't plant. They get all these incredible blessings. And then all of a sudden, in their wealth, in their blessing, they begin to feel like we're good. We don't really need God so much. Um. 
some practical tips. The first is this. Always remember to give thanks to God for the blessings he brings into your life. Enjoy the blessings, absolutely. He brings incredible blessings into every single one of our lives. I'm not saying don't enjoy it. You should enjoy it. If he brings riches and he brings blessings and he brings food and he brings clothing and he brings luxuries, appreciate that. Give, give thanks for it. Rejoice in it. Thank him. Be like the one leper who came back to give him thanks. Give, show gratitude for what God does in your life. The second practical tip with this is, is simply remember this. God's blessing in your life is evidence of his goodness, not yours. Amen. His blessings that he pours out of you is because he is good, not necessarily because you are good. Your only hope of being good is to be connected to God. We have to constantly remember there is nothing good in me except for the greatest thing of all. And if we ever get to the place where we disconnect from him, there's nothing of value left within us. We have to constantly remind ourselves of that. I could do nothing apart from him but I can do all things through him. It's that incredibly important balance that we have to strike and remember his incredible blessings. It is his loving kindness and his mercy, not your righteousness that saves you. When he comes through and he does amazing things, when he brings salvation, and, and by salvation, we mean more than just the cross, but every day when he brings salvation to your life. To be saved and healed and redeemed and to experience his connection with God. Every day he's doing that in your life. And it's not because of your good deeds or your righteous acts. It's because of his righteous act that he does over and over again. Um, I guess what I'm trying to say in this, and, and I don't know if I'm doing a good job of this, is sometimes we can allow pride to sneak in. And we begin to think that we're experiencing the goodness of God because we deserve it. Or because God's blessing me because he just really likes me more than other people. Because I've got it all together. I've got it figured out. Because I'm good. He wants to bless me more. Um, so, the problem that he's highlighting in, in the wealthy is that they're hoarding. They're holding on to everything. They're just spending everything they have on themselves. The problem is they're thinking too much of themselves. And they're thinking of themselves too much. Which is what pride is is to think of yourself too much, to constantly be focused on you. And we can tend to do that when we start experiencing blessings, thinking, ah, it's because of me. Now, you would never say that because, you know, you've been around long enough to know not to say that. But I think sometimes that thought starts to creep in. Like, look at how he's blessing me compared to them. Clearly, I was right. And I've got a better relationship with Jesus than they do because look at what he's doing in my life versus what he's doing in their life. Oh, Lord, help us know. Humility doesn't mean thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less <laughs> and thinking of God more. That's the key. Humility doesn't mean to constantly be looking at how broken I am and how disgusting I am and I'm just this horrible sinner. You're thinking of yourself an awful lot if that's what you're doing. Instead, be okay recognizing that, but then turn that quickly to, oh, but he is so good and he is so righteous 
and he has called me his own, and he is transforming me into the image and likeness of his son, and he's transferred me from the dominion of darkness to the kingdom of his son, whom he loves. Focus more on him when you are blessed than on you. Focus more on him when you recognize all this stuff going on in your life. That, that's the key, is to focus more on his righteousness, not on your sinfulness, certainly not on your righteousness, but focus on him because he is good. Because if you remember to do that, if you keep that always in front of you, then the, the blessings that come, the riches that come, the favor that comes won't pull you away from him because you understand that he is the source of it. And constantly being in a place of gratitude. You guys, I, I can't tell you how many times when Corey and I will go home, I will say to her, I'm so thankful that God has given us this home. Over and over again. Because I never want to forget my gratitude and my incredible God who blesses. I want to constantly be focused on him. I, I'm so thankful for the, the family that he's given me. I'm so thankful for the friends and for this church that he has provided. Let us never grow weary of giving him thanks for the incredible blessings he brings into our lives so that we don't ever begin to think it's because of us. And it's always because of his kindness and his mercy and his love. Um, let me keep going. Are we doing okay? Yeah. I need a drink of water. So I mentioned, I think there's two reasons that he brought this up. This condemnation on the wealthy who are focusing just on themselves and hoarding all that they have. And the first is to remind the Israelites or the, now the, the believers, don't, don't fall back into that. Because a day is probably going to come where the church has favor, um, you know, because you're connected with God. Don't forget where it comes from. Don't begin to rely on yourselves. And I think the second reason is because he's pointing out these wealthy are the ones who are bringing persecution. Um, and I think he's trying to remind his brothers and sisters to be patient in that. Verse seven. Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. So you have to remember for them as farmers, rains came basically two seasons of the year. Now for us, I mean, we have sprinkler systems. We don't have to worry about the rain. And if the rain doesn't come, it's still a big issue. We still have problems. Um, I mean, we just went through a massive period of drought in California. Now, aside of the fact that your water rates went up and didn't go back down, just want to throw that in there too. Um, <laughs> besides that, has it really, have any of you felt the impact of being in a massive, like massive drought over the last several years? It's because we found ways to, to kind of make things work and to, to kind of do it ourselves. Now, I'm not saying irrigation is a bad thing. I think it's an incredible gift from God that he's, he's taught us how to manage the, the gifts that he gives us well. I think that's being a good steward. Um, but, but I think in understanding what he's saying about being patient, he's saying, listen, I know there's people who are doing some pretty nasty stuff. And they're hoarding all of the things that the people need. And they're persecuting in you. And they're, they're treating you horribly. And, and, and caught, like killing you even, it says. It's like, I know that's happening. But be patient. And learn to wait on God. Just like a farmer waits for the rain. And a lot of times it feels like, is it ever going to rain? You have to learn to be patient like that. 
Just know the spring seasons will come. The crop will be fine. You too have to learn to trust God with this stuff. Don't try to fix it yourself. Don't run out there and put a sprinkler system up. Trust him with the rains. They will come. You too, be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Um, let me just say it this way. Don't seek the one, don't seek to be the one who tries to balance the scales all the time. You're not the judge. Pray. And I think get out there and do what you can to help those who aren't receiving what they need and, 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 and be an expression of, of justice of God for them. But don't be the ones that feel like I need to bring balance to this whole thing. You can't do it. And you will burn yourselves out trying. Just go out and love people. Love the one that's in front of you. Bless the people who are around you. Don't try to fix everything. You can't. The Lord is coming. He's coming soon. Entrust the judgment to him. Which leads to verse 9. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Okay, so don't grumble against your brothers and sisters. Um, This one actually, I really loved digging into the language a little bit on this, um, because it's fascinating what becomes clear when you you look into the original language. Um, So right now we're moving from being patient with the persecution that's coming from outside of the church to the irritation that's coming from within. Um, the word that's translated grumble uh, is, is probably better translated as like to groan or to moan. Um, okay. Doesn't apply to any of you. But I've heard at churches, there's people that are in the church that like when you interact with them, you leave that interaction and you're just like, oh, that's that's the word right there. Grumble is that that oh, that oi. Oh, my gosh, that 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 (laughs) you got to stop. That is what James is saying. That irritation, that annoyance, that frustration that you have with your brothers and sisters, oh man, you, you can't allow that to stay. We, we got to be serious about that. I mean, because I, I don't know. I think it's too easy to let that sneak in. And, and if we could learn to be patient with people who are persecuting us, surely we can stay in a better place with our brothers and sisters in Christ. So watch out for that, oh, that groan, that inward groan, even if you don't say it out loud. Um, so practical tip on this. We need to learn to start recognizing annoyance or irritation with one another as a wall and a barrier to fellowship. As soon as we choose to allow that, ugh, we're building walls, we're laying bricks that is separating us from the rest of the body. And the next thing you know, you're gonna be walled in, unable to receive any of the blessings that God has poured into the church for you. Now, I'm not saying this is always the way, but. I've been walking with Jesus long enough to know and to have learned that a lot of times the people that are kind of irritating maybe or a little bit annoying or kind of gets under your skin a little bit, those are probably the ones that God is going to bless to bring you a blessing. 
And what you're going to need to get to the next level is probably in them because he wants you to learn to love one another instead of building walls between you. This is too hard of a word. (laughs) I could tell you to, to forgive those who persecute you and kill your brothers and sisters, but don't get annoyed with each other is just too much. Lord, increase our faith. Um, Second piece of advice on this practical tip. When you feel that temptation of annoyance or that irritation, take that moment to pray for them. It's amazing how that will shift you very, very quickly. Just bless them. And like really not, oh, Lord bless them. Like (laughs) really bless them in that moment. Lord, I just pray for them and that you would help them in this moment. Pray for them how you would want them to pray for you. Like really do it. Instead of building walls, build connections. But what if my brother annoys me 70 times seven times? Mm. Well, that kind of gets to this next point. Verse 10. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience, In the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. So this last idea I think he's coming up with in what we're going to cover today is this idea of perseverance, which for some reason I always want to say is perseverance. Totally know it's not the right pronunciation, but I feel like it's a fun way to say it. And now I've ruined you, and you're going to think perseverance every time you see the word. Um, We have to learn how to persevere in patience. Whether it be patience with the persecution that's coming from us, coming at us from without, or patience with our brothers and sisters that might be bringing irritation from within. We have to learn to persevere. Now, sometimes people talk about the patience of Job. Job didn't really have a lot of patience. It's actually a very bad description of Job to say he was patient. He wasn't patient, but he did persevere. He got frustrated and he voiced his frustration over and over, but he never gave up. He kept leaning in on God and he kept persevering. He did not give up. And that's the key. You can accomplish more through perseverance and a little bit of of effort than you can with a lot of effort and very little perseverance. Um, One of my favorite sayings, and I like to think of this as we enter into the new year, is we always overestimate what we can accomplish in a day, but we far underestimate what we can accomplish in a year. Perseverance has incredible power when it comes to the the, the economy of the kingdom. Whether it's the um, persistent widow who didn't give up and would just keep praying and asking and knocking. Or it's Job who just, he was struggling and he was going through some stuff and he got impatient sometimes and he got frustrated with his friends and he was very frustrated with God, but he persevered and he didn't give up. He had a mustard seed of faith and that's all he had the entire time. But perseverance plus a mustard seed will eventually get it to take root and grow into a tree. He didn't give up and, and, and we have to learn this. A short-lived patience is of very little value. Um, Patience without perseverance is like eating healthy and exercising really hard one day a month. Now, Now hear this. This part's important. Eating healthy and exercising one day a month. Is eating healthy and exercising good? Absolutely. If you only do it one day a month, it's still good, but is it going to change anything? No. Being patient with one another 
being patient with the world, it's good, but nothing's going to change until you learn to pair it with perseverance. Practical tips here. We need to be intentional about our patience. Guys, it's hard watching the news. It's hard even just reading the highlights. It's really hard to stay patient. It's hard when the difficult times come to be patient. It's hard when people hate you for no reason to be patient. It's hard when people are frustrating you like, I can't, I can't believe they're doing this. It's hard to be patient. It's even harder to persevere in that patience. But we have to get to a place where we are choosing to be intentional about patience, not just hoping it will happen. Where we choose this day, maybe, I am going to be patient with my brothers and sisters in Christ. I am going to be patient with all the politics and stuff like that that's coming over the next couple of months. I'm going to be patient with what's going on in the world. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't try to change things and make things better. Absolutely, we should. But we can never do it from a place where we're angry or we're impatient. You don't want to be like the parent who spanks their kids because they're furious. You should never do that. You should wait until the emotions have died down and then deal with it properly. We have to learn to be patient and be intentional about being patient and maybe not just stopping at patience, but hopefully moving to love and intentionally seeking the best, even for those who persecute us, even for our enemies. Absolutely for our brothers and sisters in Christ. So we need to choose it. Second, um, we have to stop allowing the inner dialogue arguments. Um, You know what I mean? The, um, well, you know, if I was talking to him again, like, she would say this and then I would say that and then she'd say this and I'd say that and be like, bam, you got nothing now. And like, you rehearse these arguments or when I get together with, I'm going to say this and this and this and this. And you rehearse all of this stuff. That is not building patience in you. You're building up an arsenal. You're building up hate. Stop. And, 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 you know, we're commanded to take every thought captive to Christ. So when those thoughts come in, and let's be honest, they come in, you need to stop them. Tell them no. Like your thoughts, do you know this? Your thoughts will listen to you. Some of them are stubborn and it takes a while, but they will listen to you. Like when those thoughts come in, sometimes you actually have to say out loud, stop it. Because sometimes it's the enemy putting thoughts in your head. Sometimes it's just you putting the thoughts in your head. But if you choose to stop it, they will stop. Um, um, Oh, goodness, who was it? Luther, I think, said, I can't stop the birds from flying overhead but I can keep them from building a nest in my hair. So he's saying like, I can't stop the thoughts that are gonna fly around from time to time, but I can make sure it doesn't build a home in my thoughts. When those thoughts come, you gotta shoo them away. Tell them to stop. Whether it's with something on the outside in the world that's frustrating you, or maybe a brother or sister in Christ, that's irritating. Don't give it free rent in your head. 
Um, and the last one is this, my last practical tip as it comes to this, is let's be people of blessing, not cursing. Uh, it's kind of along the same idea of making sure that if you feel that frustration coming in, you begin to pray for them. Bless people as often as you can. An incredible lesson I learned with gardening is probably the most practical and helpful way to have less weeds in your garden is to plant more flowers. If all you do is keep pulling weeds, you will never stop pulling weeds. But if you always focus on planting flowers, eventually the weeds will just be weeded out. There won't be space for them to grow. If you focus on blessing one another, like really blessing one another, both when you're together and when you're apart. If all of a sudden you start feeling an irritation with a brother or sister in Christ, use that as a reminder that you should be blessing them right now and pray for them. When you hear of something bad happening in the world around us, or someone who's treating anyone poorly, use it as an opportunity to stop and pray for them and bless them sincerely. Now, there's nothing new in what I've said to you today compared to things we've talked about before. The question is, will we persevere in doing it? I don't want us to leave here today and try really hard to do it tomorrow and then by next Sunday it's gone. We have to be intentional about building this into our lives, about persevering in love towards one another, in patience towards one another, in patience and love towards the world to the extent that it is appropriate. Let us be people of blessing and not cursing. Let us work on that. Now next week we're going to finish up James, um, which will get us up to Christmas time. Uh, James ends with like a firework finale with just blasts going off over and over and over again. It's an incredible way that he closes out his letter. Um, and that's what we're going to look at next time. But for right now, I just wanted to take a moment to give you two minutes. And I want you to search your heart and see if there is any anger that you're carrying towards someone, any frustration. If there's any, ugh, when you think of someone that's in this room, or maybe a family member. If there's anyone who seems to irritate you and just gets under your skin, it just uh, bothers you and drives you crazy. Let's be intentional right now about blessing them. Sincerely blessing them. Now, let me give you a, a structure to do this because then I want to give you just some time. But a structure to do this is simply something like this. Lord, I choose to bless so-and-so. Just begin there. And then what you want to do is you want to speak over them the blessing you feel like you want to send towards them. So like uh, blessing is the opposite of a curse. Scarily, we understand curses better. Like if you curse someone, you want this bad thing to happen. So you speak the bad thing over them. Right? I hope they get into a car accident or, you know, something like that, right? It's very specific with curses. That's how you have to be with blessings. Be very specific about what blessing you want for them. Lord, I just, I just bless them now with this sense, this feeling of lightness where the burdens they're carrying doesn't bother them right now. That, that's a blessing. I bless them with peace and that the, 
the battles that are going on inside of their heart would just quiet down and they would just feel peace right now. Do do you get the idea? Okay, so take a moment and let's figure out who you need to bless. Lord, I pray that you would open up our eyes and our ears and our hearts, open up our minds, and Lord, would you just speak to us now? And would you direct us and help us to, to know, bring to mind any person that you would have us bless today? In particular, anyone that we've held anything against and stood as judge over them. As soon as you got your person, if you need to begin with forgiving them, then start there. Just releasing them from any hurt that they've caused. I choose to forgive so-and-so for what they said to me that one time or when they did that thing, I choose to forgive them for that. Once you feel like you've forgiven and you're not holding anything against them, then move into blessing them. But mean it. Don't just say the words. Ten more seconds. Okay. Let me finish with verse 12. Because we can talk about doing this and be like, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be intentional about persevering through it. And above all, above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. All you need to say is a simple yes or no. Otherwise, you will be condemned. If we say we're going to follow Christ... Let us follow him. If we say we are going to forgive, let us forgive. If we say we will be patient and we will persevere, let us be patient and persevere in it. It doesn't mean you're not going to fail from time to time. Again, that idea comes up over and over again in this book. You will fail and there's freedom to fail. You just need to get back up and keep moving in the right direction. Yesterday, I neither worked nor rested. I wasted time. I fell. But I got back up, and I will persevere, continue to persevere in following Jesus. Let our yes be yes, and our no, no. Let us persevere in our patience for one another and our love for one another, and not give up ever. Let's continue to fight. Let me pray for us. Lord, help. Because I know there's no way that we can do this on our own. My willpower is not strong enough to sustain love towards my enemy. 
It's not even strong enough to sustain love towards my brother and sister, but I know with you all things are possible and that you will continue to pour love into me that I may have an overflow of love for all those around me. That you will give me your patience to be patient with those around me. And Lord, help me to never get to the place where I rely on my wealth and my riches and my blessings instead of relying on you. And Lord, I just want to say thank you for the incredible blessings that you have spoken over my life. Thank you for being so good and bringing me salvation. I pray this in your wonderful name. Amen and amen. Thank you for listening. To continue the journey, you can find us online at IamAntioch.com or join us next Sunday.